Welcome. Welcome you all to the Loao and World Scholars Part 1 with Professor uh, Craig Fry, Episode 1 from the Australian National University. Um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of uh, the Australian land and uh, my respect to all lineages and all scholars, but let us uh, start uh, with a brief introduction of uh, Greg. Greg, I'm so glad and it's a privilege and honor uh, to have you for the second time. Uh, you were talking with uh, Luciani on Wednesday and to have you again to go uh, deeper to your academic work, it's, it's uh, it's much appreciated from the Loire University and, and myself. Uh, before we start, I'll, I'll just briefly introduce uh, Craig. Uh, he is the Director of Graduate Studies uh, in International Affairs at the Asian Pacific uh, uh, School of uh, the Australian National University. Uh, he has been there for quite some time. He did his master there. And I first met um, Craig in the 80s when I came straight from Artenisi University to, uh, after doing my, my Bachelor of Arts, to, to do my master uh, in the faculty of the ANU at the um, um, Faculty of, of Sociology. And uh, now and then we, we have been meeting, met in, in a lot of conferences at the, at the Australian National University and uh, we are neighbor here in Ainsley. And uh, without further ado, um, I'll just pass on to, to Craig uh, to, to say something before I direct the, uh, the talk this morning. Uh, on two main uh, issues, or three, with, uh, with a conjunction with his, uh, his academics, particularly in two books, mm. uh, work of, of within, yeah. Thank you, Siva. Thank yeah. you. Thank and you. thank you for having me today. It's been uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to talk about yeah. work that I've been quietly working away at in my own study, but it's yeah. nice to share with yeah. people from the Pacific, and because uh, yeah. I think a lot of the work is very relevant to how people are living in the Pacific. Yeah. Beautiful, 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 yeah. Um, Craig, uh, I got two books here, and I think will be uh, enough for us to chat about uh, your overview, and I think you're going to, you know, overview of the Pacific diplomacy and international affairs, and I think it's going to lay a foundation for upcoming scholars in the area uh, if we have the chance to talk with their individual views. But I think the important. Um, importance of this morning is for you to share with our audience out there your overview about um, Pacific diplomacy and international affairs in relation to, to other related issues. Uh, but I would like us, maybe it's going to be enough for us to, to, to just talk with these two books because they will reflect a lot hmm. countless issues and, and fundamental issues as well. Um, but I, I would like to start with, the, with um, one of the books that you were uh, uh, one of the editors with uh, Sandra Tate. Tate, Tate hmm. yeah. Uh, this book here, it's uh, called a New Pacific Diplomacy, mm. which means there was an old one, <laughs> and now, yeah. uh, and, and, and most of the, of the authors here, some of them are your students, eh? and, and also other scholars. Well, but, I, uh, but with the title itself, it reflects the fact that there was an old, and there is a new. Mm. And my understanding of the old is uh, after Second World War, yeah, or maybe 
since the decolonization mm. and the formation of Pacific Island Forum. And uh, here is the new, which you mentioned here. It's from the 2009, where there is a, 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 a environment, a platform for a paradigm shift, shift mm. yeah, as, mm. as, the, as the president of uh, Kiribati Tong had, had uh, alluded to. Mm. Mm. So, um, firstly, I'll just bring two or five, not two, five main points that you mentioned here. Uh, and it, and they were being discussed throughout the book. Um, and maybe will be enough for us to go on these five points, and I think then we move to your own book, uh, The Framing the Islands, mm. uh, on, on other related issues as well. Okay. Um, in the introduction, you mentioned there that uh, there are five points. Firstly, um, what is Pacific diplomacy? Secondly, uh, the new Pacific diplomacy. Thirdly, uh, the new Pacific, uh, the significance of the new Pacific diplomacy. Secondly, is what are the expressions of the new Pacific diplomacy? And uh, fourthly, how should we understand its emergency? And fifthly, what are the implications of the near Pacific diplomacy for the negotiation of Pacific Island interests and for the future uh, regional architecture? So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll just start with the, okay. with the first point and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, Craig, uh, what is, uh, sorry, what is the new Pacific diplomacy. What is new Pacific diplomacy? Okay, so thank you, Sue. I think the the first point I'd like to make, make is that uh, when you said it's, okay, it's new diplomacy and there's old diplomacy, that's yeah. true. But to make it more complex, there was an old old diplomacy. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and the old old diplomacy was the one familiar to many of your listeners, I think, which yeah. is. Uh, Ratamara and Tupelhake yeah. and, yeah. and, and uh, the Samoan, Samoan leaders and, and, and so yeah. on in the early years of independence. Yeah. And they were very solid. 60s, 60s yeah. 70s. 70s, yeah. And even 80s. And then they got together with the Melanesian leaders like Samare and so on. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and Vanuatu's Watalini. And they were all very effective in diplomacy with the global yeah. powers on decolonization, on trade, on nuclear issues, yeah. and so on. They're very strong, very yeah. assertive, very um, determined to do a good deal for the Pacific, mm. to renegotiate yeah. the trade and all that. So that was how it was happening in 1970s and yeah. 1980s. Then suddenly, after the end of the Cold War, the Pacific lost a lot of its uh, punch. Mm. Uh, it, first of all, the leadership changed. So all those old leaders that knew each other very well and worked together so well, they, they moved on. And so we had younger people who had more problems at home. Like in Fiji, we had coups. Yes. In Papua New Guinea, the Bougainville War. Yes. Vanuatu had some problems. We had yes. the issues around uh, a new generation of yes. leaders who didn't really know each other, yes. and they didn't feel they had the convening power of someone like Ratamara. Yes to actually have the mana, the, the, the authority to call, the authority, that's right. to call uh, the group together. So uh, it was also a, a time of uh, uh, the end of the Cold War. So it meant that America was ascendant, Australia was ascendant in the region. Yeah. And so the Pacific didn't have a choice between groups. They couldn't uh, play one power off against another. The other, yeah. yeah. So for 20 years, we had a very quiet time for Pacific diplomacy, which I call the doldrums. Yeah. And so that in that period, Australia and New Zealand dominated, the Pacific wasn't assertive, the leadership didn't emerge and assert itself against the global things affecting it. Yeah. So when, when, we, when we talk about the new Pacific diplomacy, we're really talking about something new that occurred in 2009 onwards yes. mm. against that period of the doldrums. Interesting. Interesting. So suddenly we have this same feeling of what happened in 1971 or the 1970s. The same feeling was there. Strong leadership, assertive, confident leadership yes. from all across the Pacific, yeah. and a big desire to have self-determination, to have yeah. 
to, to, to stand strongly on things like trade, decolonization, climate change, yeah, yeah. all of these things. So that's what we were trying to capture uh, in that book because our students were feeling this in Fiji at the University of South Pacific. South Pacific They're all right. talking about it. The, the people coming to talk to the students were all talking about this, the regional institutions, yeah. the Fiji government, yeah. the, uh, the NGOs. They're yeah. all strong on yeah. the need for the Pacific to stand up yeah. And uh, so President Tong came to give a keynote speech to the students, mm -hmm. and that opens the book. Yeah. A lot of our students wrote their essays, their yeah. thesis, on Could different be. aspects of the new Pacific yeah. diplomacy, yeah. showing how the Pacific stood up on tuna, yeah. or how the Pacific yeah. stood up at the UN on decolonization of, yeah. of French Polynesia, yeah. or how they stood up uh, to create a new Pacific group at the UN that other countries respected. Yeah. Uh, so these are all in the book because there are our students talking about it. It's lively. It's happening mm. all between 2009 and 2016 or 17. 16, 17. So yeah. about a decade there yeah. of incredible activity. Mm. And it's still going on. Yeah. Uh, but that's what we're calling the new Pacific diplomacy. Yeah. A set of ideas that, that the Pacific should be in charge of its own destiny. That's right, yeah. That we they need appropriate institutions to carry the Pacific voice forward to the global level. Global level, yeah. So not, yeah. not and not hampered by anyone else. Yeah. And that they should be able to talk with a pure Pacific voice about climate change yeah. or their real interests and not be compromised by other interests. That's right, yeah. And um, that they should have uh, inclusivity, that the peoples of the Pacific should have buy-in. Yeah. This is a crucial big point of the, the new Pacific diplomacy, that there should be the involvement of civil society, yes. the private sector, not yes. just the state, not, not just the not government. Not just the government, the state, yeah. So it should be everybody involved, mm. and that was represented in new institutions like yeah. the Pacific Island Development Forum yeah. and the Pacific Small Island Developing States. Keep going with uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry, it's okay. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so that was a uh, a time of uh, a big change of the institutional development that really yeah. really expressed. The, so the new Pacific diplomacy can be seen as ideas, yeah, and then institutions, yeah, where these new ideas are expressed, Express. and then strategies, like working with other small states around the region, around yeah. the, the world, yeah, and building up power. So take starting with the power of the, of the Pacific. And then going into the larger organisation of all the island states. Yes. And then going yes. into the larger organisation of all yeah. the developing states. Yeah. And then taking forward the Pacific viewpoint all the way. Yeah. So when you finally get finally get to a big global conference like yes. Paris yeah. or the Rio summit yeah. with 50,000 people, yes. then the Pacific view is there at the table of the final treaty making. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So it's a very clever set of strategies and, and it was very successful. So that's yeah. what we're calling the new Pacific New Pacific. Pacific. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, this is a continuation or continuity of the first phase. Yes. And the transformation to kind of second phase. Yes. And uh, to this one. And at the same token, if uh, I am uh, I got it correctly, it's it's a moving from the domination or the great influence of of the great powers or mm. superpowers or worldwide to to more to be more um, inclusive within the government states themselves. Yes, and uh, with a new strategy. And uh, it seems that there is a, a kind of maturity there, more mature within the government and the institutions, social, political, cultural, and economic, within the Pacific to, uh, to uh, do things themselves at the same token with the assistance or kind of direction from the great powers in the United Nations and particularly in New Zealand and Australia. Yeah. So, yeah. so the key the key really the is the paradigm shift, yeah. the shift of ideas, eh? Yeah. And a lot of this is about clever diplomacy. So if you clever think clever diplomacy. So these are very small states, they have very small capacity in terms of power, mm. but in fact they show a lot of power through clever diplomacy. So that cleverness comes from yeah. uh, focusing agendas, 
building coalitions. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and using NGOs, yeah. using ideas, framing yeah. uh, agendas. Framing, yeah. Uh, and I think through all the, and using the media. Yeah. So all of these things have been very important. Very important. Yeah. In, in a new a new era. A new the, era. Yeah. And. Uh, and what it's mean by Pacific diplomacy. Mm. Uh, Craig, I think we have touched some of the issues um, in relation to the to the other four questions, but I would just like mm. us to, to continue because I think our audience and, and myself as well would like to hear from from you um, in this uh, this opportunity that you are here. Uh, the second one what are the expressions of the new Pacific diplomacy? So I guess we, we've seen some of that, we've talked about some of that already, which is the institutional expressions. Yes, yes. But also the uh, expressions, I suppose the strategies that we've seen yeah. and the outcomes. Okay. So these okay. are all expressions. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it's okay. about, about the statements of, of leaders as well, saying... Yeah. Now, large ocean states, we're not just small island states. Yeah. One of the interesting things here is the use of Apele How Office framework. Yes. So yes. a lot of the leaders are really using his words without knowing it. Mm. They're all talking about... Unconsciously. Yeah, unconsciously. <laughs> they say, we're no longer small island states. Yeah. We're large ocean states. That's right. And so that's his point. So a lot of people are using his words. Yeah. Uh, and it's become the kind of new branding of the Pacific, if you like, yeah. as a way of empowering Mm. the Pacific in diplomacy yeah. at the global level, taking yeah. on the biggest powers. Yeah. And the success has been enormous. So we've got uh, a, a big recognition from all countries in the world of this group of countries acting together. So yeah. they're all trying to get that vote from the 12 votes from that area. Right. Yeah. They're trying to influence the Pacific because they yeah. realise that they're, they're strong together. If they're together, yeah. they're strong. Yeah. And if they're well yeah. led, they're strong. So, right. so they have to have good leadership. Yeah. Leadership has to be getting on well. And the governance, have, the idea yeah. of, of good governance, and, and, and at the, the regional yeah, level, yeah. It has to be good regional governance. Yeah. Mm. And solid, the leaders have to be solid together. Yes. Yes. And when when they do that, they're pretty invincible in a lot yes. of these areas. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, that's very uh, informative, Greg. Uh, I'll keep on going. Um, and, and we will come back, uh, you know, to, to clarify a few issues. At the third point, how significant is the new Pacific diplomacy? I think you have touched it, but mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. to follow the order of, yeah, yes, so how for, significant, yeah. Okay, so for me, it's a major turning point in Pacific history. Yes, yes. Uh, much like the, the 1970s with Ratamara and the Tongans and Samoans getting together to, yeah. to overthrow colonial regionalism. That's right. So yeah. I think this is the next big historical juncture for the region. Yes, yes. In terms of who can controls the region? Who is it for? Mm. Who speaks for the region? This is really yeah. taking us right to the core of politics yeah. at the or regional political level. Political power, power, power yeah. uh, itself, yeah. And so, mm. and everything else flows from that, all yeah. the policy issues. Yes. Uh, you have to have it, the pr people have to have control of the agenda before you can look at climate change or that's right. trade or anything else, cultural certainly, heritage. Yeah. Certainly, yeah. yeah. So that's what it's about. Yeah. So it's a big change, in my view, it's a transformation of regional diplomatic culture hmm. in, the way, in the way it's organised and, and, and yeah. Of, yeah. It's a reflection, as you mentioned, Greg, that um, with power, with political power, uh, it's like the centre of things, you know, hypothetically speaking, because hmm. if we we can't fix it or adjust it or adapt it, then other things will be consequently affected in one way or another. And, yes. it's, and that's right. And it's not only, it's not always evident. If you're sitting yeah. in, a, in a village in uh, Vavau, yes. you don't necessarily see the importance that's right. of this yeah. regional level of yeah. politics. Yeah. Politics, which does affect how people live at the local level. That's right. Because yeah. in a global world, the global managers yeah. are managing. Yeah. They see the Pacific. They don't see Tonga. They don't see Vavao. That's right. They're looking yeah. at a regional free trade area or they're looking at uh, a regional treaty on something like this or a, mm. a regional fishing agreement. Yeah. So 
the Pacific has to respond in kind and, yeah. and assert itself to get the best deal yeah. for everybody. Yeah. And then that flows down to the, the, to the, the, the people in the villages. To, to the grassroots. Yeah. And, and as you mentioned before, that's why this new Pacific diplomacy is also crucial because of its uh, uh, penetration or permeating to the wider community mm. from village to village on the grassroots level. That's right. Uh, it's a reflection of, of major change in the social and economic and cultural uh, lives of, of the island. Uh, and, and the islands. ideology of the New Pacific Diplomacy yeah. is much more inclusive, so it is trying to get the voice of people who aren't in government yes. also to come into that, that political Beautiful. process yeah. at the regional level. Yeah. Citizens now. Yeah. Uh, people, so it's, it's, it doesn't mean that the state or the local is irrelevant, they're still the most important things in people's lives, the church, the state, the nation. Yeah. But it's just another level of politics which is important That's right. as yeah. well. The Pacific yeah. Islander, the region, yeah. the Pacific Island region, mm. people yeah. operate on that basis, on so you have, to, you have to get into and fight in that area. That's right, that's right. Um, the fourth point with uh, this book of New Pacific Diplomacy, um, how should we understand its emergency? Ah, that's and, that's a good and, and point. Yeah. That's a really good point. It just suddenly um, emerges. So because why? you mentioned yeah. something maybe talk about people they yeah. they don't really aware of it. Yeah. yeah. So it emerges uh, almost overnight because of the Fiji from the Pacific Islands Forum. Yeah. So Fiji is a catalyst. Okay. Because it feels excluded. After the coup, you know, and the, 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 the forum said you, you have to stay outside until yeah. you have democracy again. Yeah. So it started to create new organizations okay. and to talk about regional self determination. Yeah. So it, it was a catalyst and okay, okay. It, it, it made things happen. For example, the Pacific Island Development Forum, which Tonga supported. Uh, so it was a good thing that came out of it because this meant that you had an organization where people could talk for several days without Australia and New Zealand present about yeah. what their objectives were on climate change. Yeah. And so that meant for the first time they could go to a, a climate change conference with the Pacific viewpoint at the top, yes. and exactly what they wanted to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. And they had everybody that was there, the NGOs, the private sector, academics, were all participating in this discussion. Yes. Yes. So that was a good thing. Uh, there was also a reinvigoration of the Pacific voice at the UN yes. through Fiji's efforts. Yes. But I think it's important to point out it's not just Fiji. All the rest of the Pacific supported that. They yes. saw that was a logical thing to do. We yes. need to get together. Yes. We need to have one group at the UN that people can come to as the Pacific group. It's a Pacific group, yeah. And we have to talk to other southern organisations. So we have yes. to be the Pacific Islanders, not just yes. Pacific Islands and Australia and New Zealand. Yes, yes, yes. So that, that worked really well. So it meant that uh, we tend to see it as a Fiji uh, origins, but I think it's really important to Fiji. Fiji wanted a much more radical new Pacific diplomacy. The yes. rest of the Pacific said no, New Zealand, yes. out of the forum, and we don't want to uh, make the Pacific Island Development Forum replace the Pacific Islands Forum. We yes. want things we've built to stay. Yes, yes. And we want you, Fiji, to come back into the forum yeah. and to fight there for what you believe in, but not to have a separate a new institutions. So I think the, so the overall result is that the emergence of the new Pacific diplomacy was spurred on by Fiji. It happened because of Fiji, but it wasn't yeah. the only important thing. The important thing was the rest of the Pacific leaders wanted something new. and But they didn't want necessarily what Fiji wanted. They wanted the same principles, yes. self-determination, options to assert themselves at the global level. Yes. But they didn't want to get rid of Australia and New Zealand from the Pacific Islands Forum. Yeah. They wanted it to play out with politics. They wanted people to stand up in the forum yeah. against Australia and New Zealand if they yeah. had to on climate change, for yeah. example. Yeah. So that's really what's happened since. The forum mm. itself has changed. Yeah. So I think uh, the emergence has been um, uh, a common feeling around 
a set of new leaders that something had to be done to assert the Pacific in the global yes. arena yes. and that uh, some change had to occur in the Pacific Islands Forum yes. to make it more back to what Ratamara and others envisaged in 1971. Yes, yes. So that's what they achieved, I think. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So it's uh, a big change mm. also. It's a big with, with the structure and, and how things are done yeah. and the relationship between within uh, islands themselves and between them and New Zealand and Australia. Yes, and it's more a, um, a chance to have a, a respectful relationship where the Pacific is respected for having its own interests yeah. and wanting to pursue them yeah. and uh, not to be... Uh, stopped from pursuing them by Australia yeah. and New Zealand saying, oh, we haven't got a consensus, so we can't vote on that, you know. Yeah. So um, before that became a veto power for Australia and New Zealand it's on right. climate change declarations, yeah. for example. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a big change. But one last point on this is that uh, uh, there was another, there's, no, there's more evidence that it wasn't just Fiji, and that's the other thing that happened in 2009 was the creation of the Pacific, the parties to the Nauru Agreement. The Nauru Agreement. And that that's really right, is yeah. the OPEC of the Pacific. Yeah. So that's the Tuna states getting the together Tuna and state. setting their price yeah. and working out ways of controlling the foreign fishing people. Yeah. And they've got a lot you know, more money through that yeah. system. Yeah. And that's without Fiji. Yeah. So that shows that other countries are also thinking the yeah. same thing. Yeah. That's right. We don't yeah. need Australia and New Zealand, we don't need yeah. America, we just we need to do it ourselves. Yeah. And that yeah. was clever diplomacy. Yes, yes. By yeah. a guy called Transform Akaral. Yeah. And he, he he believed that they didn't need a bureaucracy, no secretariat, just a couple of people. Okay. Everything will be outsourced, particularly ideas. You look for the best ideas. Yeah. And you bring those ideas in and that would change things. Yeah. And he didn't want any money, a bit like a Pele Hawafa with the arts. That's Central. right. I don't want any money. I just yeah. want. Uh, well, I was like that too. <laughs> yeah. So, I, so we, we we're not dependent on anyone else. Yeah. So yeah. he said, if we can get more money for the fish, then we'll take a percentage for the secretariat. That's right. Uh, yeah. Administrative cost. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It was a very clever model. Very yeah. clever, and um, and it's realistic to build a, a, a concrete strong local economy within the Pacific yes. to build from within themselves yes. rather than uh, for many years as a belly mm. uh, mentioned uh, several times to totally depend on on uh, the great parts and the western donors yep. east yep. The, the the asian donors now are coming in yeah um so uh, yes yeah, so it's balancing all those interests yeah. so but the pacific's not saying we don't want any outside powers mm. it's not saying we don't want a relationship that's it's right. saying we want the relationship on our terms in, 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 that's right that's mm. yeah in our terms yeah. not the yeah, for our people for our people perfect perfect yeah um Craig will come to the last point, uh, and as I said before, I think you will cover <laughs> you cover most. Of, but uh, uh, I'll just want to to mention it, you know, to you again. What are the implications of the new Pacific diplomacy for the negotiation of Pacific Island interest and for the future regional? architecture. Hmm. This is uh, a well, very interesting comes to individual interest and how it relates to the regional hmm. uh, architecture. Okay, so it, this is an important point. We, we do need to add something here because at the moment I think your viewers will be aware that, that there's been a, a split away from by the Micronesian states in yeah. the forum. So if we're looking to the future, the implications of the new Pacific diplomacy will depend a lot on how well the leaders now mend this relationship through yeah, using yeah. the Pacific way. So uh, I think that, I think it'll happen. I think people will work hard to try and bring the Micronesians back into the family. And uh, if that's the case, then there's a chance of having ongoing uh, implications of the new Pacific diplomacy to pursue the Pacific interests. So it's a very dependent thing. It depends on good leadership and good unity. And at the moment, there are some threats to that. So it'll depend a lot on the Pacific leaders in now bringing people back into the fold. Interesting. Uh, Craig? 
something goes. Crack something, hang on. 